I'm Paul Sullivan, your host on the Company of Dads podcast, where we explore the sweet, sublime, silly, and strange aspects of being a lead dad in a world where men who are the go-to parents aren't always accepted at work, among their friends, or in the community for what they're doing. Lead dads, whether we work full-time, part-time, or devote all of our time to our families, are here to step up in a world where the assumption is that childcare is still done by moms or paid caregivers. The Company of Dads is here to bring together other lead dads and show that what we're doing is good for fathers, mothers, and the whole family system. To learn more, go to thecompanyofdads.com backslash the dad and sign up for our weekly newsletter. Today, my guest is Eve Rodsky, who is changing the way working couples coexist. Her book, Fair Play, a game-changing solution for when you have too much to do and more life to live, was a bestseller when it came out in 2019. Its premise is there's a better way for couples to divide up the tasks of life, of parenting, of the house, of the chores, of all the stuff that isn't fun but needs to be done. And in addition, for women to recapture what Eve calls their unicorn space, that space to live, to be creative, to be full people. But what she advocates for helps the entire family. What couple doesn't remember those pre-kid days, maybe even pre-marriage days when weeknights were relaxed and weekends were unstructured? That book spawned an empire. She has a card game to help couples understand what each other does. She has a second book, Finding Your Unicorn Space, that came out last year. And she created the Fair Play Institute, which she partnered with Hello Sunshine, Reese Witherspoon's media company. She also made an awesome documentary that premiered last year at the Tribeca Film Festival. Eve, welcome to the Company Dads podcast. Wow, what, I'll take you on the road with me, Paul. What an amazing intro. Not this intro you, it'll be fun. <laughs> um, it's hard to to understate or hard to even overstate the impact of what you're you're doing. And I remember, you know, you and I met uh, in the fall of 21, right after I left the New York Times. And I remember writing you an email in May of last year. Uh, I, I have to share this story. My wife, who is an elite runner uh, at the University of Kentucky, has had all kinds of uh, surgeries, all kinds of orthopedic surgeries. And one of them was to replace her hip. And there she was at, she just had her hip replaced. She's at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. This wonderful nurse is helping her get up and walk. My wife is delirious and telling the story about the company of dads and, and what we're trying to do. And this woman says, it's so wonderful that your husband is here. I don't know if my husband would be here. And she says, you know, what this nurse is, the company of dads, what, so dad, any chance you know Eve Rodsky? And I was like, yeah. And my wife is like delirious, like wobbling all around. I was like, what? you know, she, my, my husband and I were about to get divorced and, and she's like, the, the cards, the book, we do everything. And literally my wife faints at that moment and the two nurses pick her and she's still talking about you. And I was like, Eve is wonderful, <laughs> but could you just pick up my, my wife, please? Uh, when you hear, this is not the first time you've heard stories like this. I mean, what has this been like for you? I mean, the, the impact has just been fantastic. Mm, thank you, Paul. You know, I think it's, it's so interesting because when I started this journey in 2011, it was so different. And I know you felt that way too, I'm sure, right? For how people would be receptive um, to even the idea of a lead dad now. And I do think we've made a lot of progress, but when I started this, I remember um, feeling like I was being abandoned <laughs> by my partner, um, because all of a sudden, as, I, as soon as I had kid, all these assumptions, as you said earlier, that yeah. all this unpaid labor and childcare would fall on me. This was happening in a relationship with my husband, Seth, who I'm still married to, by the way, but um, was starting to feel extremely unfair after our second son came along. But also my workplace was treating me terribly because their assumption was that I wasn't going to stay after my second son because a lot of women didn't, um, and they didn't want to give me a day from home to work. They didn't want to give me a place to pump that wasn't like a dark stairwell. And so I think, I love that you say that there's an impact of this work, because when I started this work, I was probably at the darkest place in my life, which was that everything I had been told I could be uh, with my Harvard Law degree and with all the accolades and everything I'd tried to do, um, it was all a lie because all those milestones, Paul, that I was supposed to be smashing, right? I was supposed, like, I wanted to be president of the United States. I wanted to be a senator. I wanted to be a Nick City dancer. I had all these dreams. 
And I remember thinking I was going to smash all these glass ceilings, but really the only thing I was smashing was like peas for my toddler, Zach. Um, and I think that reality of the darkest place in my life is sort of where fair play came out of. So that's what I always think back to that, you know, I can't believe how far this movement has come and I, I just feel so grateful for it. Yeah. And I didn't go into that part because I mean, your, your bio is, is so impressive, but before you became, you know, before you became Eve Rodsky, you know, when mm -hmm. you were just Eve, you were, you know, you went to Michigan, you went to Harvard Law School, you were working at, a, you know, I'll leave it up to you if you want to name the firm, mm -hmm. but you were working at a, a very prestigious uh, bank in mm -hmm. New York, uh, and you're an attorney. I mean, let's, let's place all this, you know, yet you were, you know, being treated as if you were a, a second class citizen, as if by some means, you know, having a child or a second child was going to compromise your your brain, and I think, and again, I don't want to put words in, but I think that that is, I see it with my own wife, and and mm -hmm. you know, we have three kids, and what she went, she works in asset management, and what she went through, and I mean, how much of it do you think? I mean, you are very identifiable with a certain slice of successful, uh, smart, you know, women working moms in America who have been getting you know the shaft for a long time. Do you see you know? Is that when you look back, is that do you think that's part of the reason why this movement has has really, you know, caught on because you gave a voice to to people who were just, you know, you know, kind of working and trying to get on with it? Well, I think it's similar to what you're doing, Paul, because um, and it was actually funny. I I'm obsessed with this woman named Suleika Juhad. She she writes a book uh, called Between Two Kingdoms about her um her struggle with leukemia. And she actually has this newsletter where she was talking about the struggles of writing about people who are alive. Like, mm -hmm. can you write a memoir if there's people in it that are alive? <laughs> and it was such an interesting uh, exposition, this newsletter about a lot of people waiting to write their memoirs or write about their parents when they're dead. Sure. And I, I, I remember that struggle because to launch the fair play movement, what I felt was that I had to tell my own story. But by telling my own story, what I had to do was expose the cracks of my own marriage. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, back in when this process started of thinking about writing this story, because I was doing a lot of the fair play work for, for years since 2011. But when I wanted to bring this to a book, that was around you know 2016, I think. And I had to really think about what was this going to do to my marriage? What was this going to do to this idea of perfectionism? Because there's all these articles that now show that women um, do not admit um, that they have help in the home. They don't admit often yeah. that maybe they have a stay-at-home partner in the home uh, because we get shamed for it um, either way. So uh, women do not admit that they're having struggles with their partners over these issues because they always have to say like, Oh my God, you know, Seth is great. I have the best husband. I should feel grateful. Um, he's not abusive. We've sort of been, <laughs> we've been at the, at the very low bar, Paul, of what should, we, we should be very, expecting very yeah. of what we should be expecting from our partners. So the idea that I had this, you know, wonderful partner in the home, but I had to expose the cracks in my marriage is probably why many, a lot of other people haven't done it, to be honest, because I actually think it's, it puts you in a very vulnerable place where people obviously can criticize you and um, you have to be willing to take those risks. Yeah, I can identify with that because, you know, I don't know if I would be a lead dad. I don't know uh, if I would have, you know, left the times to start the company of dads, if not for my own, you know, childhood, which was, you know, my parents were divorced. And I said, you know, my mm -hmm. parents were really bad at being married. And yes. turns out they're even worse <laughs> at being divorced. And so right. if I hadn't seen that as a model, but my dad is a wonderful grandfather. And so I, you know, I, I, I play that down because, and I, I focus on the positive of, okay, I've got three daughters. My wife has this career. I was thoroughly fulfilled at the New York times and I was the lead dad. But, you know, as you say, it, it's, you know, I don't want to misstate it or overstate it. It's almost, you know, I was a lead dad for almost the entire time I was at the New York times, but I didn't talk about it. Right. I was Paul, Paul Sullivan, New York Times columnist, Paul Sullivan, author of XYZ book, you know, uh, you know, Paul Sullivan coming to a conference near <laughs> you. Um, but as soon as I started talking about it in terms of lead dad, I, you know, I live in, you know, Fairfield County, you know, affluent, you know, commuter part outside of New York City. 
I had all these guys that I've known forever who suddenly stepped forward and said, you know, I'm a lead dad too. Mm. And it was, it was been very gratifying because it was, you know, naming it. And that's what, you know, made the, the difference. And it's lead dad is positive, but so is, you know, fair play. You're, you're not saying like, you know, yell at your partner or no, no. get that lazy guy <laughs> off the couch. You know, that, that that's, it's, no. that's not great branding, but this is. Well, you know what? Honestly, fair play is a love letter to men. And it's funny. One man said to me, well, I'm, I was willing to accept your rage, <laughs> the female rage in the, in the first part of your book, because the system felt very familiar to me. It was a man who was in the military. And the truth is, I tell some stories that hopefully have some humor, but but there is some rage that came from that period in my life. As I said, that dark period we started with. But the beauty of fair play, similar again to the idea of lead dad, is that you can't measure what you don't, you don't manage what you don't measure, as Peter Drucker would say. And so um, the way I look at the world, um, which I think was very resonant to men, which is why I think fair play is done very well with, in hetero cisgender couples, because I don't look at the world, I'm not a therapist, not that that's a bad way to look at the world, but um, I remember we had a couple of therapists who said, you know, just start communicating, use I statements, like I feel, I'm like, well, can I say I fucking hate Seth? Like that's an I statement, right? So, you know, it, it didn't feel like enough to me. So what I had to do is I wanted to elevate the, this conversation about who does what in the home away from just like, oh, you're incompetent, you know, you do nothing. I have to redo the cleaning when you do it, um, which is sort of the trope of the incompetent man in the home. And really start to understand that our home is our most important organization. Because my training as a lawyer is in governance and organizational management. Um, I work for families that look like the HBO show Succession, Paul, and you know, you should feel bad for me. But And so does your wife, by the way. Um, and what, but what I've learned from working in these very difficult families was that even with very, very difficult conservative patriarchs who I, who their family offices brought me in to work on their succession planning for their family businesses and big ones. I'm not saying I work for the times per se, but the New York times is a family business. There's, there's a sure. lot of big companies out there that are actually family businesses. So that's who I work with. But so I'd be brought in to talk to these men. And we'd sit down and I'd ask some questions early on in, in when I started to do this work. And I remember I had I started to get so many of my clients, these again, these sort of reticent patriarchs saying to me things like, Well, I don't know why you're here because I'm not gonna die. <laughs> no, seriously. And so what I would say is, okay, well, all right, I'll see you, you know, later. No, I had to have a way to break through conversations. And what I realized was that card decks games was actually a really wonderful way to break through especially to men and so fair play became a game mm -hmm. and it's to me it's an easier way to have hard conversations because there is a card game that's forcing you to do it as opposed to your partner and i learned again that having difficult conversations in game form again especially to men and then you couple that with systems thinking which is sort of where again i'm trained that was very very again very resonant um, i felt like with men yeah. And, you know, I think every, every movement has a, a foundation story that you, you come back to. And, and in my final column, the New York times, I wrote about, you know, years ago being on the a phone call with Laura Tyson, who'd been in the white house council of economic advisors. She was then the Dean of the Berkeley business school. And I'm talking to her out in front of the ballet studio and she, on, on, my, my dad has taken one of our daughter, the other daughter at the time to the pediatrician. And my dad is calling from the pediatrician's office. And we know that if I don't take this call, the you're done. I'm done. Yeah, you're, you're not done. getting it back. And <laughs> yes, I don't yes. know if my daughter has a fever or is dying, you don't, you know, cause your kids are, you don't know. And so in the midst of this call mid question, I hang up on her. I hang up on, you know, the former, you know, council of economic advisor chair, I hang up on her and she starts calling me back because who hangs up on her? Yeah. Nobody hangs up on her. And when I finally, you know, resolve everything, the pediatrician, I, you know, take the call. And then I say, okay, I can't lie because I'm a New York Times columnist. I can't lie. So I say to her, I'm very sorry uh, we got disconnected. The cell phone service in my <laughs> town is horrible. Where were we? Which it All is. Of, which is true. It is. It is. For you, that equivalent is, is the blueberry story. And I know mm -hmm. you've told the blueberry story 
uh, quite often it was in your documentary, which is remarkable. But talk to me because it's mm-hmm. like, you know, resentment doesn't happen overnight. It, it builds up. And I have to say it builds up like like dust bunnies under a mm-hmm. couch. And then suddenly you look and you're like, holy cow, a lot of dust under there. For you, it, it, it came to a head at the blueberry moment. And to talk about that mm-hmm. that that moment and that story and how it, it really, you know, helped catalyze what you've done in the decade since. Well, it's funny you said that because I had one man say to me early on in my fair play research that he was divorcing over a glue stick. So we get we could go. Well, into glue stick is yes. different. A glue stick ma- makes a mess. I mean, <laughs> exactly. come on, let's be honest here. I, I think it turned out that it was his wife decided to leave, and her story was, you know, she was done doing all the homework projects, and he couldn't even bring home a glue stick. You know, all so, <laughs> but but in my my mine was my metaphor slash non metaphor uh, literal breakdown. My blueberries breakdown was over a text that Seth sent me. Um, I love it's always you and I both have that cell phone in, in common. But when when I was, um, when my second son, Ben, was born, that time I was telling you about where I felt like at the low point in my life, uh, and my job was giving me a lot of hard time and shit from coming back for a second child. So I was already having issues with my workplace um, and feeling really nervous about coming back. Around that same time, I was taking my son, Zach, to picking him up from his toddler transition program because we had just gotten into preschool and on the way to pick up Zach from that toddler transition program. When I had a breast pump and a diaper bag in the passenger seat of my car, um, I had gifts for the newborn baby to return in the back seat of my car. I had a client contract in my lap. Uh, Seth decides to send me a text that said, I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries. So passive aggressive when I think about it now, but um there was something about the way he said that, Paul. I don't. I don't know. It still triggers me to this day, and that was again in 2011. Uh, that it made me stop. And actually, I was going to be late to pick up Zach, which I never do. Similar to like we don't pick. You know, you pick yeah. up for the pediatrician, but I decided to pull over to the side of the road, and I just started to sob. I. I. It was like, what is the point of all this? Like, why did I choose to have kids? Why, why am I in this relationship? It felt like I wanted to eat, pray, love it. That was like the narrative back then, like out yeah, of my yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. I just, I felt like I had no solutions to this um, unfairness. Cause what I was thinking in the moment was not only was I the default or as I call it in fair play, the she fault, even though again, it could lead to lead, lead dads have the same issues, but because it falls predominantly on women um, or it has been until you're, you know, you company of dads is disrupting that narrative. Uh, that she fault was me. But on top of it, um, the idea that I felt like I was no longer Eve, I had no agency in my life, that, that I was, my time was completely set for me by all these expectations. And, and one of those expectations was that I was going to be the fulfiller of my husband's smoothie needs. <laughs> and that's really, that was it for me, right? That I, I sort of lost. And then around that same time of that breakdown and my workplace abandoning me, and Seth sending me this text, when I went to that toddler transition program with, with Zach, they asked us to sometimes sit in on classes. And back then, again, I didn't have any lead dads with me. It was just moms and a couple of gay fathers. But when we sat in that circle, Paul, this preschool teacher said, this is going to be your social safety net. These are going to be the people who will carpool with you, be there for you when yeah. you, your kids are sick. And I remember looking down at my name tag and it said Zach's mom. And I remember thinking, these are the people that are going to know me better and support me better than anyone's ever known me. They don't even know my fucking name. Yeah. And so I think it was that overwhelm and erasure at the same time, like my identity being erased, erased into Zach's mom, plus the overwhelm of being the she fault for everything, including being the fulfiller of Seth's smoothie needs, that I just felt like I there was no there was no recourse. I couldn't live like that anymore. It really was like, I have something has to change. Yeah. And you know, this catalyzed the movement. The book comes out in 2019 wildly successful, but then nobody could have, you know, expected or planned for this. We go into this pandemic when suddenly you're not in an office anymore. You're not going to any toddler transition times. Nobody is leaving and you are, you know, stuck inside together, at least those of us who who are privileged enough to be able to work, you know, remotely. 
And that to me was the genesis of of the company of Daz. I started thinking, you know, differently, but for you, it was really when, uh, you know, fair play went from Mm -hmm. a book to, to, uh, a movement. And I I can imagine, you know, suddenly, you know, husbands and wives saying, wait a second, (laughs) you're not really that busy. Like, what the hell have you been doing? Like, what? Yes, what? Yes. That's a whole bunch of nonsense. Like, what are you watching on the? You're, you're watching golf. Like, are you kidding? The kid is like, how that? You know, you, you know, serendipity plays into a lot of successful movements. You couldn't, you couldn't predict, but it, but it worked. And suddenly, you had, you know, this this groundswell of support. When you look back, like, how have you, you know, when you think of things you're most proud of and how you've helped couples, because, you know, you and Seth are, are together. You, you yeah, have we're together. Three, <laughs> yes. three kids. You, everything's going, you know, you, you, yeah, marriage yeah, is you know, yeah, yeah. You're, it's going well. But you helped a lot of people. And, you know, talk about how that felt. Talk about how you, you, you found a way, you know, you can't just do retail politics. It had to be wholesale. You had to find a system to help hundreds and thousands, you know, thousands and thousands of people coming in. How did that, how did that happen? And how'd you make it work for all those people who needed you? Well, I think the most important thing for me to realize was um, that there, there was no evil there. There really, I started to talk to men in 17 countries. And what I realized was there was no like evil man. There really weren't very many or not at all that I really spoke to men who said to me, I just don't want to help in the home. I don't want a relationship with my kids. Like I wasn't hearing that. And so I think I had this narrative that there were all these men sort of sitting out there being like, this is amazing. I want my wife to to wait on me. But even in the most patriarchal cultures, because I come from a very religious um, Orthodox Jewish background, I wasn't hearing that at all. I was hearing on an individual level that women were feeling overwhelmed in these who were partnered with men, but that men weren't saying, I love it this way. Men were saying to me things, Paul, like, um, I don't know my role. I don't know my place. One man said to me, um, we decided to take the dog out right when it's about to take a piss on the rug. And so I was sort of laughing because I was like, that is when you don't have a system in place. Right. Right. Even my Aunt Marion's Mahjong group, I found out, has more (laughs) clearly defined expectations in the home. You don't bring snack twice to that group, you're out. But when I would ask couples if there's any I expectations, mean, that is mahjong though. That that's pretty intense. Like I'd be afraid <laughs> to go. Intense. To, you know. I know. But how is Aunt Marion's mahjong group? Um, you know, this is a CEO telling me he doesn't know he's taking his dog out, uh, and I'm thinking this person has systems probably everywhere else in his life, right? I know. We know now that the most successful companies have a DRI mentality, like a directly responsible individual mentality, or a context not control mentality. Uh, This idea that you give someone context to complete a full task. Even our kids, we teach them executive function, do something from start to finish. But in the home, what I realized was it wasn't working for people that way. And so the big insight that I think worked really well during the pandemic um, was that 50-50 wasn't working. Mm -hmm. That this idea of 50, like, what does that even mean? Like, you take out the trash once, I take out the trash once, we have to have it on a scoreboard. You take the kids to school once I take the school. No, no, no. If we back up and we realize again, that's not how it works in the most successful corporations or organizations. We're not sitting there saying, you're going to take you know, minutes once and I'm going to do this and I, you're going to be the CFO for one day and I'll be the CFO the next day. No, yeah. we have job descriptions. We have um, ownership mindsets when, when it comes to something, you own something. So that was... I think the breakthrough that worked really well in the pandemic um, was people understanding that the fair play is not about 50, 50. It's about ownership. Yeah. It's about the fact that if you are holding a card, cause that's the metaphor of the game, there's a hundred cards. You don't have to hold them all, but if you decide as a family collectively, you were going to hold one. So I'll pick one right now. So say money manager, Yeah. money manager will do that. I've got, I've right. got my card right here. I love it. Right. Yeah. Or if you I'll pull another one gifts, I'm not saying you have to hold this quote unquote card forever, yeah. but if you're holding gifts, right, for for one Christmas, then you're in charge of, of all the gifts. And then you can redeal at any time. But this idea was very revolutionary because in my before, right before the pandemic, when Seth and I were really, I was trying to explain fair play. What he said was he wanted me to tell the story of extracurricular sports. 
because for him, that was the biggest aha moment for him in fair play, that I was holding most of the cards. Mm -hmm. He was pitching in at just the execution stage, right? So I, I make the metaphor, right? That the ownership mindset really was the breakthrough. And I got to that breakthrough by asking couples like you, Paul, like, how does mustard get in your refrigerator? And, be, and that was such a beautiful question because you can ask that in 17 countries. It, it gets the, in quite uh, often in my refrigerator because I have like seven jars of mustard, yes, which I exactly. happen to like. I like mustard, but I like sometimes I think, <laughs> is there any like relish? Yeah. Right. Well, that's it. There's so many mustards. But <laughs> I think the issue was that women were reporting that they were the ones noticing their son likes yellow mustard, not spicy Dijon with their with their protein. They were the ones monitoring the mustard for when, when it was running low and getting stakeholder buy-in for what the family needed. And then they were asking their partner to go to the store for the mustard with zero context. You guys bring home the spicy Dijon every fucking time. And then, and then all of a sudden I heard all these women out there telling me that they didn't want Paul to be in charge of their living will because the dude can't even bring home the right type of mustard. <laughs> wow. And once I realized that this if you're in a, a coma, breakdown. you want to have Dijon. Everyone yes, should know. Yes, this. come this on, like, yeah, come yeah. on people. Yellow mustard, it was <laughs> yellow for, the, for your son, Johnny. But I think the issue was that once you have that conception, the planning and execution when it stays together, similar to what we do in our workplaces where we, we own a task, it really is helpful again to men because then they don't have what typically is called as nagging. I call the rat fuck. Or the, or the rat infestation of a home. Most men, even lead dads in many in many cases, where conception and planning was still st staying with a, a mother, um, a lot of men were getting what I call the rat infestation, which is a thousand random assignment of tasks over and over again in a day yeah. with zero context. And that, that's like a terrible way to live with zero psychological safety. So I think that was the big insight during the pandemic. People were willing to try a new system, Paul, because they realized decision fatigue wasn't working for them. Uh, and 50-50, they didn't even know what that meant. So ownership was something that they were willing to try. And that was my big breakthrough. And it really helped. And we know now, we have literally, as you said, thousands and thousands and thousands of couples who sort of use the fair play system however they want to use it. I don't tell you how to live, but I give you the tools. And it's been really fun to watch people move from scorekeeping to ownership. But in, in, in so many ways, you can get it to work in, in the home. You know, my wife and I, you know, pre-fair play, it just happened to work for us that we would yes, own, yes. We own, would own certain tasks. Exactly. And like, I schedule everything. I do the the doctor appointments, but she loves, you know, we celebrate Christmas. She loves doing the Christmas. And She's it just, holidays, right. She yeah. holds the holiday card. She holds that the holiday be, card. You hold the medical and healthy living card. Exactly. That's very, you were already living fair play. Similar we were living to, it. Yes, yeah. you were living it. But there, there are headwinds, and there are headwinds in our communities because, Correct. God damn it, if the school will not call right. me first, yes. if the like, I, I poor Dr. Anna, our dentist, I, I always curse her because I'll make the appointment and then they'll confirm it with my wife, I know, who has yeah. you know no idea, and you know how do we get past that? So, you know, the person whose name is at the top of the call list is actually the person who's called because if you want full ownership, you know, you, to, you go back to your office metaphor, which obviously I love because I was a business, you know, reporter, mm -hmm. like you call the right person. There is a tree right. and you know who reports to whom and you call the Correct. right person, but we can't figure that out in society. How do we break that? That's why this is, I call fair play a movement and not a book, because I think if private lives are public issues, Paul, which is something that you, this is exactly, again, similar why Company of Dads is a, became a media company, because it is private lives are public issues. You can be a lead dad in your community, but it's not going to break through to culture unless you understand that this is a public issue. And so I think, of course, we need people like you, right? We need lead dads out there and everybody in your community um, is also part of my fair play movement. And I'm part of your movement because we have to do this all together. Um, and I think the biggest issue that we're trying to break um, is that care work is just so undervalued. Mm -hmm. It came out of a legacy of slavery. Um, it's often done by women of color. We had this very toxic uh, 2000s where I think outsourcing became like the narrative, right? You could just outsource everything. Um, but what does that mean, really, that black and brown women will do it for you? Right. Very problematic uh, language around caregiving. And so really the movement 
which is why, again, we have to get people to, it's not as easy to get people to call the right person on the phone tree. The movement is understanding that an hour holding our child's hand in the pediatrician's office, what you were just talking about, mm -hmm. is as valuable as an hour in the boardroom. Because if we believe that it's a society, if we believe that as a society, then we will actually believe that men men are doing it. Because right now what happens is that in a patriarchal society, we've chosen to value men's time as, as, as diamonds, I like to say, and women's time as if it's infinite like sand. Mm -hmm. So so again, if you became a, a lead dad and you enter quote unquote a woman's world, it's gonna be really shocking for men, I think, because it'll be the first time in your life probably where you start to feel devalued, which is how women feel all the time right. because our work is always devalued, right? Our time is always devalued. Um, you just have to look at every single health department in our, in our country has had a brochure at some point that said breastfeeding is free when it's really 1,800 hours a year, it's a full-time <laughs> job. But women's time has been devalued and women's work has been devalued. So again, I think until we realize that an hour holding our child's hand at the pediatrician's office is as valuable as an hour in the boardroom, then men who enter women's fields like, like uh, lead dads are going to feel the same devaluing of that work and care work as women have felt for all these years. I, I obviously agree, but it, it's one thing that, you know, I, I say a lot that if you are having the most important phone call of your day with the person who is going to advance your career or the biggest sale ever, you would not drop that phone call if somebody else called. And I think the same thing should be with your children. If you yeah. are with your children for that 45 minute period, hour and a half period, treat it as if it is the most important phone call of your day. Don't be interrupted. And then you you can catch up with it later. We had a guy yeah. on the podcast uh, end of the year who is a CMO of a financial services firm, and he puts on his calendar that he has these two hours each day to get his son ready for school. But it's really impactful because, like you, he is on the West Coast and his firm is based on the East Coast. And at first, nobody believed him. Nobody believed that he was actually doing this. And they would call him, and he would answer the phone like, why are you calling me? You can't read my calendar. <laughs> like, oh, oh, sorry. And then they stopped calling him. That was good for him, but it was also great for his organization because he was yeah. setting this example and people, 100%. you know, yeah. I do believe this is a movement. Like, the, and I think, so it's, it was a financial services firm. And this was a couple who was trying fair play before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And, but it was a pandemic for them because um, his wife, I'll call her Julie. She was getting really, really burned out. Um, and her mom was dying. She was in hospice. So she wanted her husband to take on more tasks. It was during the holiday. And I remember this thinking, this is a terrible time. Like it's during the, you don't ever want to enter a new system when emotion is high and cognition is low. But I thought, okay, well, if it fails, at least it's a good data point for me. Cause I'm still in edits. I was still in edits for the book, even though the story didn't get in because it came too late. But what was so fascinating was this was a, 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 a man who's on the road all the time, all the time. Uh, for work at this financial services firm, but he wanted to, his wife not to collapse in, in stress. And so I said to her, well, what, what card in the deck would you want him to take over ideally right now? Um, let's, let's start with one card since you're holding them all. And she actually just said it was the homework card um, because there was at the end of the year, there's all these uh, secret Santa projects. Mm -hmm. You know, thank you schools for making it so stressful for us, but it was, it had to be homemade. Oh yeah. It was her second. Can you write a card? Can you do 17 cards? Oh my God. All addressed? Yes. All dress. This was homemade second son yeah. secret Santa project. So that's like, say that fast. It's like a tongue twister. <laughs> but what was so interesting about this project was again, they had to, I said, you have to do it with the ownership mindset. Yeah. And typically Julie was saying to me, well, I can't tell Ed, I would I need to tell him where to go for the thing. And I need to tell him what to build because he'll forget. And I said, honestly, ownership mindset, if it doesn't work, we'll come back after. So she does this. She gives Ed the second grade Secret Santa project. But instead of telling him where to go and what to do, I ask her just to take a step back, which is what I'm asking most couples to do who may be new to fair play and start thinking a little bit more about your why when you give context, it's a good way to do it at work as well. And so I ask her why she cares so much about this project because it, why, so you care so much that this is the one thing you wanna hand over to Ed right now. And she said it was two reasons. One, 
like your wife, Paul, she loves the holidays yeah. and she felt like her child was starting to ask for a hundred dollar Nerf guns. And she wanted to instill in him that actually a homemade gift, there is value in making something for somebody with your hands there. It's not just the commodified stuff at the store. And then she said, the other reason was the little girl who Brody, her son drew was a new to the school. This was December and she should have friends by now. But what the mom noticed was that she stands lines up with her backpack waiting for recess to be called and nobody like goes over to her and runs and they don't, she doesn't play hula hoop or a uh, handball. Yeah. She just sort of waits there. And so she said her son is really popular and how cool would it be if like Brody, the sort of popular kid says like, welcome to the school. Here is this really beautiful project. So that's why she cared. She didn't want to not have it turned in because yeah. she felt bad for this little girl. So I said, well, why don't you just tell Ed that like over, I don't know, a cocktail or like cookie dough or something. So Ed actually is the one who responds to me after the holidays and tells me that he heard Julie's why he took on this project with his son with full ownership. They started to Google on YouTube, secret Santa projects for little girls. His son is the one who decides on a popsicle stick jewelry box mm -hmm. with a knob because the little boy Brody wanted her to be able to open it with one hand, which I thought was a really cute detail that this man Ed told me. <laughs> and then he says to me, well, I discovered there's this really cool stock store called Michael's and like you can buy <laughs> all of like the, 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 the stuff in one place. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Ed. I'll, I'll go check out that store. <laughs> um, and then they build this project. But I think the beautiful thing was what Julie reflected on to me, which was two things. One, she had never seen her husband on the floor before. Wow. And when she came home, they were building this project on the floor. She had actually never seen that before. He had never been on the floor before, which I thought sort of made me tear up. And the other thing she said was out of the corner of her eye, she saw that Ed had glitter on his hands. And I think the beauty of that, she said to me, was it was the first time that glitter besides the fact that it gets everywhere. Now he has that, that, glitter, that, yeah. that, yeah, he knows that too, but that it was the first time she felt like he was like truly in it with her. And Paul, this was one project. And I think that's when I understood the beauty of fair play, that it didn't have to be a complete systemic change in how things run, but there was this beauty of ownership. And not only that, but later on, Ed told me that Brody actually cried in the car because he was like, my grandmother's dying. This was Julie's mom. Yeah, yeah. And I and I never asked Ed why he told me that, but I'm gonna think that he told me that because most men don't have experiences like that where like my kids cry to me all the time. I wouldn't be calling you today, Paul. My kids are crying to me again. But I'm not sure Ed had many experiences like that where his son opened up and, and was as vulnerable emotionally with him. So I don't, that's a small story, but I think that's no, but it's a the big story. Of, yeah. yeah. It's a bit, but it's, it's that story that, that hopefully, you know, set their relationship in a different direction. That's how I and, feel. And that's the point where everything pivoted. Yeah. That, I, I, and, and by the way, and this man is actually one of the only financial services firms where they stayed hybrid as opposed to calling people back to work. I'm not saying that fair play is the reason, but I do think that I'm sorry. I mean, I have to feel like there's some sort of correlation between yeah. his new involved um, willingness in the home to understanding the beauty of hybrid work. Eve, I could talk to you forever. I want to mm -hmm. thank you for being on the company yes. podcast, but one last question for you, because at the back of my mind, we're talking about what the fair play movement has, has done for other people. I think of what the company of dads can do for, for, you know, working moms and lead dads, but we both have, you know, three kids. And I often think of, you know, the example that my wife and I are setting in our home for our three daughters. How has, you know, what you're doing, what you've done already with the fair play movement, how has it, you know, influenced uh, the way your, your two sons and your daughter think about, about, about life, about, about their futures? Well, I think, um, it's so interesting because they, the, it comes out so practically in a lot of ways, actually for my kids, like, um, where they're shocked that, you know, boys, their age, like don't know that baby girls get their vaginas get wiped from front to back. Cause my kids have been changing diapers <laughs> since they were like six. Uh, we were listening to Trevor Noah's book, uh, with my older son. And, um, there was a big clash between his mother and her new husband around, uh, him wanting her to do all the dishes. And he's like, wow, 
even in South Africa, mom, you know, there's, they have fair play problems. So I think um, it, it, it's, we're sort of inculcating this idea yeah. that um, executive functioning, owning a task is, is something you should know anyway. And if we can move from assumptions about who does what to actually talking about it, guys, we're gonna have a much stronger family unit. And I, I do feel like that will change society if everybody did that in their homes. And as one woman said to me, you know, she was actually okay doing it all, Paul, but she decided that she wasn't okay having her daughters watch her do it all. And and so can you imagine this model? That's why, again, why I think our 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 work is so beautifully intermeshed because your lead dads are are the key. Uh, they, they're the key because it, it shows us that people come in and out of being intense at work, intense at home. Uh, we can redeal these cards. It doesn't have to be static. But the one thing that lead dad does the best and, and that company of dads does the best in this idea is that it, un, it upends assumption and it moves towards um, more structured decision making. And we know that when we upend assumption and we move towards more structured decision making, then um, that ends bias. It's a great place to end. Thank you again, mm -hmm. Eve Rodsky, for being my guest on the Company of Dads podcast. Hey, thanks for listening to Company of Dads podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, but I'm here to tell you it's just one of the many offerings we have at the Company of Dads. We've got another podcast. We have a weekly newsletter. We have various features. We have events that we put on both online and in person. If you want to know about all of those, the best place to learn about them is to go to the company of dads.com backslash the dad. That's the company of dads.com backslash the dad. What do you get if you do that? That's how you sign up for our weekly newsletter, the dad, which is a one-stop shop for all things the dad. Thank you again for listening. 